welcome to Sisterhood Smarts. Today, I'm very honored to be demystifying the field of psychiatry and this aquatic mind with our smart guest, Jerry Mazinski, who has been working on the front line of psychiatry for over 40 years. So we are going to be doing a deep dive into this field. Most of you know that mental health is a big topic and that is why we are having this very deep conversation with Jerry. Welcome, Jerry. How are you? Oh, good. I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, it's really an honor to have you on. And I think to kind of set the stage for today's conversation, um, could you tell us how, tell us a little bit about your journey and how you ended up doing this incredible work, just to set some context for our listeners? Okay, I, I don't know how far back you want to go, but uh, I guess it's, suffice it to say is, you know, due to my upbringing, I, I never trusted authority. I mean, you know, so, you know, when I, when I got admitted to Temple University into the psychology program, one thing I hated most about it was there was no way to check out what they were telling me, you know, with in engineering or, or uh, you know, other fields, you can, you can go and you can see for yourself what's happening and what's not. Here, here these people are telling me, oh, okay, all this stuff is true. You just have to believe us. And, and that was hard for me to do. Um, you know, and I, I also knew that in psychology in the universities, it's publish or perish. You know, you either publish or, or you're, you're out of the game. So, you know, I watched what they were publishing and a, a lot of it was just garbage. I mean, it was just anything that they could get published. And then I saw a report, um, with regard to, I think I had a copy of it somewhere, but regard to the publications of psychology, 80% of what was published as research was not replicable when this organization went to check. So that means 80% of what they're telling the population and the university and students is, is garbage. It's just garbage. It's not replicable. And, uh, you know, I, I started wondering when I was in undergraduate school, when I hit abnormal psychology, there was just an immediate attraction. It was like, you know, what's wrong with these people? And they didn't say what was wrong with them. All they gave was a description of these different kinds of mental illnesses. Nowhere was there anything about what was causing them. You know? mm -hmm. um, and then as I got into graduate school, it was oh, it's a uh, biochemical imbalance of their brain. But this started off well before that. It, it started off, I think, in the 50s, they were blaming mothers for their sons and daughters being schizophrenic. It was like, you know, the, the mother did something to, that caused this. And the mothers are going, wait a minute, we didn't do anything. What, what did we do? You know, so that blew over. So now they, they, they didn't know what caused schizophrenia. They had no idea. So they, that left them kind of look, looking kind of dumb. So then they, they came up with something that couldn't be checked out easily. They started saying, oh, it's a genetic disorder. There's some genes that are out of whack somewhere. You know, they didn't have any evidence for that. You know, they just needed to look like they, they knew what they were doing. And they got away with that for, I don't know, a decade or so. And then some geneticists, I mean, most geneticists aren't interested in schizophrenia. So there's no way to disprove them. You know, they, they put all this stuff in their advertisements and they teach it in the universities. You know, by the way, the universities are taken over, especially in the field of medical and psychiatry and psychology by big pharma. OK, that happened in, I think, 1910 with the Flexner report where the Rockefellers uh, paid these researchers to find out who was teaching what in the U.S. And they paid off Congress to make it illegal for universities to teach anything except um pharmaceutical medicine, okay? So 
naturopathy, uh, electrical therapies, um, uh, what are the with the with the pins? I mean, all those different therapies were now made illegal. All right, they in order for a doctor to practice, he had to graduate from an institution that was teaching pharma, pharmacological medicine. All right, so they took over the medical the uh, educational system at that point, paid off Congress to do it, passed their laws to benefit them, not the people. Okay, and it's and. The medical establishment, psychiatry, psychology, has been under their control ever since. All right. um, and you'll you'll look at it even now. Uh, they're they're advertising medicines for everything. There's no other type of cure. It's only medicines. So since they didn't have a uh, an idea of what was causing schizophrenia, they just kicked it up to where it couldn't be investigated very easily at all and that they started saying oh it's the genes you know they didn't have any evidence for that at the time they did it and uh you know geneticists weren't really interested in investigating schizophrenia so they looked like they had an explanation oh it's genetic and there's nothing you can do about it except take our meds you know but after a while, there were some geneticists who did start doing research in the schizophrenia, and they didn't find any genetic markers for schizophrenia. And they published that. So what the, uh, what the psychiatric establishment and Big Pharma came back and they go went, well, it's, it's, it's not just a specific gene. It's a whole bunch of genes, and they're all mixed together, and eventually we'll find out what it is. But right now we don't know, but you know we're pretty sure it's a genetic kind of thing. So they went along with that for decades until some honest geneticist came along, started doing the research and said, hey, we don't see any genetic marker for schizophrenia. It's just not there. You know? So they had to come up with something else, you know, something that couldn't be investigated easily. So they came up with the biochemical imbalance garbage. Now, that was come up by a, a drug manufacturer by the name of Eli Lilly back when their Prozac came out, and they needed some explanation for how it worked. So they, they go, well, you know, it, it somehow affects serotonin, um, so, and it's a chemical, so it, it must there must be a chemical imbalance that this thing fixes. You know, they, you know, they went on with that for, for decades, and they're still doing it right now. You know, they're, they're still publishing that in their advertisements for schizophrenic medications. Oh, it's it's believed that it's a chemical imbalance. That was disproven years ago. Right? Um, <clears throat> you know, I have the documentation here somewhere, but one of the higher ups in psychiatry said it, it's a myth. You know, no well-trained psychiatrist believes that there's a biochemical imbalance. Now, I didn't know that when I went to work at one of the biggest psychiatric hospitals on the planet in Milledgeville, Georgia. Um, but what I did see was when I asked psychiatrists, what, what causes this? What, what, what's the cause of schizophrenia? I mean, what have, what's, what's with all these people that are locked up here? And, uh, you know, they say, oh, well, it's a chemical imbalance in, in the brain. But one thing I never saw after years was you think if there's a chemical imbalance somewhere, they would need to take some kind of baseline to figure out what chemicals in the brain are out of balance and by how much. I never, ever saw a psychiatrist do that. They would come into the, the psychiatrist's office. The psychiatrist would spend 15, 20 minutes with them. Then they they just kind of like, it was like a crapshoot. You know, well, we'll try this drug first. And if that doesn't work, we'll try another one. And if that doesn't work, we'll try another one. So there was there was no um, baseline. So there, there's what 23 or so uh, neurotransmitters in the brain. They had no idea what was out of balance or by how much. I found out later that they had no idea what the chemical balance of the brain should even be, let alone what was out of balance. It's it's all a fabrication. Yeah, and they're still they're still pushing it in their advertisements. You know, so. It, it was bizarre. It was just absolutely bizarre. And I'd ask psychiatrists, I, I remember asking one, well, how do you know what's out of balance if, if you don't have any kind of baseline? And, and he went, well, the, the drug companies tell us. They, they do all that research and we just follow it. 
And I'm like, you know, thinking to myself, like, that's a, like letting the fox in the hen house. You know, what are you what are you talking about? How, how could you do this? But that's what they were doing. You know? yeah. But but it's so it's it's. <laughs> We're dealing with human beings and most human beings are unique. Circumstances are different. Genetics are different. You can't just have a cookie cutter, you know, like one size fits all. And, you know, I guess for our listeners, you know, people say schizophrenia, but what is it, Jerry? You know, you know, because we don't want to use the dictionary definition. We want to really understand what is it and does it manifest in just one way where they can say, just take this pill. You know, it's like, okay, even headaches are different, but this is something more complex you know you can't just say someone has a headache one has a migraine one has you know there are different reasons even for something as simple as a headache so can you just help us understand from your perspective with your background and experience what is schizophrenia and how does it manifest and in which forms well there are several different forms of it the one i was concerned about the most was paranoid schizophrenia because it's the most common mm -hmm. okay now there are other kinds there's uh you know, hebephrenic, there's uh, indifferentiated, undifferentiated, there's, uh, you know, usually the, the, the paranoid schizophrenics are hearing voices, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, <clears throat> um, you know, there, there's other forms of it that I couldn't do anything with. All right? mm -hmm. Now, when I, when I got to the state hospital, everybody believed that the voices were hallucinations because that's what they were taught in school. That's what they were taught in undergraduate, graduate school, and medical school. The voices are hallucinations. Okay? There's no research ever done on that. It, it's just the psychiatrist just went, well, that's what they seem to be. So we hereby declare that the voices are hallucinations. Okay? without any research whatsoever. They reminded me of the uh, uh, Egyptian priests of old. You know, it is because we say it is. Okay? <laughs> I know, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, again, the, the the category I was most interested in, the one th it was the one that was most common, and that was paranoid schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. and, and these people are paranoid, and they are hearing voices, okay? And nobody, when I got into the, the state hospital, was the least bit interested in what those voices were telling these people. You know? It's like uh, I'd, I'd ask them. I'd ask psych nurses. I'd ask uh, attendants. I'd ask psychiatrists. I'd, well, what, what are the voices? Well, they're hallucinations. It's, it's like since they already felt they knew, they weren't looking for any other answer. Yeah, and what is a hallucination? You know, these are, again, these broad words, you know, well, that, yeah. You know, the last 10 years of my, uh, uh, I was working, uh, before I, I retired, I was working in the emergency rooms in all the major hospitals around Tucson. So I've seen hallucinations. They're random. Mm -hmm. They're all over the place. You know, you can't predict a hallucination. What's, what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. But back Back when I was in the state hospital, I started asking questions to the patients about what these voices were telling them, okay? And one of the psychiatrists found out, and I was pulled up into his office on the red carpet, and he told me the voices are hallucinations. This patient told me that you're asking questions about the voices, and he was upset, okay? So... I found out later that the voices don't like to be asked questions or or to be investigated. They get upset. So I have no no doubt that the voices had this guy go tell the psychiatrist this. And here's a psychiatrist telling me the voices are hallucinations. You know, you will not be asking questions to these patients about what the voices are saying because what you're doing is reinforcing these hallucinations and you're making the patients worse. You know? So I was ordered to stop, but I'd already gone far enough to see that the voices, in my opinion, were not hallucinations. They started running patterns from the people I talked to. Now, it took about a year to figure out how to talk to these people because there was no positive benefit to them talking about their voices. 
you know, you look at what happens to them. They tell their friends about their voices and the friends go, well, you're possessed. You're weird. Uh, you know, uh, and, and they just back away. You know, the voices tell them, if you tell anybody about us, they will think you're crazy and they will have you locked up. Unfortunately, that's what happens a lot of the time. So they tell their parents, their parents get upset, take them to a psychiatrist. The psychiatrist fills them full of these toxic drugs that, that turn them into semi-zombies and make them feel horrible. And they don't want to take these drugs. I mean, virtually every schizophrenic I've worked with has at some point gone off of those drugs because they're so awful. They're toxic. You know, they're, they're virtually major tranquilizers that turn the person into a semi-zombie. Okay. So I had to be very careful because I ended up being warned twice by two different psychiatrists at the state hospital about asking questions about the voices. You know, by the time they got to me, I knew, I suspected strongly they weren't hallucinations because what all these patients were telling me is that these voices are consistently negative. You know, they're, they're derogatory, they're insulting, they're abusive, they're destructive. Um, they, they may be positive for short periods of time, but they invariably turn around and gang up on the, on the patient. And, and this was consistent. Virtually all of them were saying that the voices were negative. Mm -hmm. And my question was, what holds them on such a negative trajectory? Why aren't they random like all other hallucinations? Why aren't they all over the place? Why aren't they some of them positive, some of them neutral, some of them negative? Why aren't they like regular hallucinations? Now, that was the first pattern that I spotted. They were consistently negative. They would tell the patient, you're no good, you're rotten, you're ugly, you're stupid, your parents don't love you, nobody likes you, um, uh, you're awful, you're a terrible human being. I mean, virtually every negative thing that you could think of to say to a person, these things are saying to these these people. Okay. Um, the second pattern that came out was that they were anti-religious. You know, I had patient after patient come and tell me that the voices didn't like them reading the Bible. They didn't like them going to churches. And what I actually saw was on the, on the psychiatric rehab um, building where I was working, when the chaplain had an ice cream social downstairs in the auditorium, invited all the patients, the only ones from my ward that didn't go were the schizophrenics. They all decided to stay on the on the uh, dingy ward, you know, either watching television or staring at the ceiling, but they never went. So I started asking, why, why aren't you down there with the other guys? I mean, getting cake and ice cream, you don't get that very often here. You know, oh, uh, I don't like preachers. I, I don't want to be preached to. I don't like sermons. I don't I don't believe in the Bible. I don't believe in God. I, you know, God's abandoned me. I, uh, I don't go to church. I don't want anything to do with it. So the voices, I started asking these people questions about what happened when they did go to church. And what I found, they broke down into three different categories. If the voices were very weak and they attempted to go to church, the voices would shut up. They wouldn't say anything in church. If they were of moderate strength, they would get louder. And they would interfere with what the preacher was saying. Or they would start mocking the preacher or mocking what he was saying. So they were trying to block out anything coming in from the preacher. And if they were very strong, they would actually drive the person out of the church. They would get up and run out. Yeah. You know, so it broke up into three different categories. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the anti-religious was the second consistent pattern that these things ran. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking if they're running patterns, they can't be hallucinations. You know, mm -hmm. um, and what else, what else did I see there? Yeah, you know, so the, the biochemical imbalance thing didn't make any sense to me because I never saw the psychiatrist ever doing any kind of uh, baseline. Mm -hmm. You know, you'd think if there was a chemical imbalance of some kind, they'd need some kind of baseline. You know, any of you who are going to psychiatrists for schizophrenia, ask them, where's your baseline? 
If I got a chemical imbalance, what's out of balance? What's out, and by how much? They will not have an answer. Yeah. This was completely fabricated. Okay. Because they have to run tests, right? Do some blood work. I don't know how they no, do it. No, they have no blood work. They have no test. There is no test for it. Mm -hmm. But it's biochemical. It's know, not biochemical. What biochemical means is that's the body, right? That's the, the body. The human anatomy, yeah. You right. have to find they're, a chemical they're, imbalance within the yep, body, right? But they have no test for schizophrenia. There, There is no test. They don't exist. For a chemical imbalance in the brain. Okay, but the, the, one of the diagnoses is, is that you have a biochemical imbalance. Well, that's what they say the cause is, but they have no proof for it. Matter of fact, it's been solidly disproved at this point, but they got away with that for another another decade. You know, so they're trying to, they don't know what causes schizophrenia. They won't investigate the voices because they think they're hallucinations. It's the voices that power schizophrenia. Once the voices are gotten rid of by any means, all mm -hmm. symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia disappear with them. Yeah. And Jerry, what do you believe or what do you believe these voices are? These voices are negative entities. Mm -hmm. They are conscious. You know, they're aware. They are also parasites. So you might call them the archons or evil spirits. Mm -hmm. you know, they speak to the patient. You know, now, what's so sneaky about them is that they sound just like the thousands of other voices that you hear going through your head on a regular day. Okay? Mm -hmm. So everybody's hearing a voice in their head talking to them. Is yeah. that what they call negative self-talk or self-sabotaging behavior? Well, it that's just the loss over it. Right. You know, right. Uh -huh. So, but those, those ideas, those thoughts are put there by these entities and they don't just hit the schizophrenics. They hit us all, mm -hmm. every single one of us. Every time you have a nasty negative thought come into your mind. So see, what people believe is because they experience these thoughts in their head, they believe that they belong to them. That's very wrong. Your brain is like a radio receiver. Now, a, a Christian mystic, Emanuel Swedenborg, th this is where we first came to the conclusion that these voices were um, something different than the person's thoughts. So there was a clinical psychologist, uh, Wilson Van Dusen, who was a Swedenborgian. Now, Emanuel Swedenborg was a Christian mystic who lived some 300 years ago. He was the chief mining engineer for the Queen of Sweden. He was one of the top scientists of his day. He was like the Leonardo da Vinci of his day. I mean, he, he was highly educated. Uh, he went to many universities. Uh, he was psychic. Uh, he made the Queen of Sweden a fortune being his chief mining engineer. Uh, he, he, he was a metallurgist. He, he studied uh, um, medical stuff. He, I mean, he, he was one of the few that knew most of what there was to know in his day. But at the, at the age of 50, he says Christ appeared to him and said, okay, mm -hmm. now stop all this scientific stuff. He said, okay. I'm going to give you access to heaven and hell, and I'm going to give you free access to talk to the beings that reside there. I want you to go visit with these people and come back and write about what you saw. So the people on the planet have some idea what heaven and hell is like. Okay. So he did that and he published volumes of books. Now, um, Wilson Van Dusen was a Swedenborgian and he was reading the works of Swedenborg, but he was also a clinical psychologist at a state hospital in Northern California. Now, as Swedenborg is describing his um, interviews, with these evil spirits in hell, Van Dusen noticed that the pattern that he was seeing and the material that these voices were, these, these evil spirits were telling him matched exactly what the voices were telling Van Dusen's schizophrenic patients. Wow. So There's a one-to-one one, one correlation. So yeah. Van Dusen saw this, but he was very guarded because he knew how the rest of the psychology profession would re react to this. 
you know. So he continued to call them hallucinations, but everything else he said countered that. All right, so he's, he was trying to cover himself. Right? And he did some very interesting experiments. Now, unlike me, where I knew they were evil from the start, I knew they were destroying these patients. I had seen it over and over and over again. What he was How trying to figure it out, Jerry. How did you figure out? Because I think most psychiatrists are just like, okay, hallucination here. How did you figure out that your patients, you know, the voices your patients were hearing were actually real life entities? Well, that took me a long time. And and even though the, the evidence was absolutely overwhelming. I still mm -hmm. didn't want to believe it. I know. Yeah, you know, it's not a simple I, process. Actually. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't want yeah. to believe in demons. I didn't want to believe that I was working with people who were possessed by demons. You know, mm -hmm. I, it, 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 I, I just kept thinking, oh, it's got to be something to do with their subconscious. It's got to be some other thing. It's got to, you know, and I kept making excuses. But as I, I had no lack of patients to work with, okay? Mm -hmm. the, the state hospital was full of schizophrenic patients. Now, if I, I've never ever seen a researcher from the outside on come to the front lines in any of the institutions I was working at, and many of them, none of them would come to the front lines and investigate this stuff. It was all through the universities who were already taken over by the Rockefellers and Big Pharma. They were wanting to sell drugs. They were wanting to convince people that the only answer is their expensive toxic drugs. They'd already taken over the medical system. They'd already taken over psychology and psychiatry. Okay? So <clears throat> when I saw that they didn't have any chemical imbalance or there was no proof for it, they didn't test for it, there were no tests for it, but what I saw is these things were consistently running patterns. So the more patients I talked to, the more patterns began to come out. And with each additional pattern, that was even more proof that these things were not hallucinations, which are random. They're all over the place. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what holds them to these patterns? Yeah. So... Another pattern I've found at the state hospital was that after these voices attacked these patients, they were completely drained of energy, mm -hmm. you know, over and over and over again. And I'd ask them, well, where did that energy go? All you were doing was laying in your bed, tossing and turning all night. Um, you didn't use it. Where did it go? They go, well, I don't know. Yeah. So another pattern appeared that the patients themselves didn't even recognize. You know, they would just know that they felt bad after the voices attacked them. And the voices were horrible. You know, they would tell them rotten things about themselves. They'd keep them up all night, badgering them, mocking them, making fun of them, telling them awful things that, that the voices were going to kill them or uh, that people were watching them or somebody was tracking them to kill them. I mean, anything they could do to make the patient upset. Okay. And I had one patient tell me that they could feel their energy leaving when these voices were attacking. Right. So I said, that's very interesting. So I started asking these patients, after the voices attack, how do you feel? Every single one of them said they were drained. They didn't have any energy. One of them said that they were so tired, it was as if they were digging ditches in the hot sun all day. That's how, how little energy they had. And I'd ask them, I'd say, well, where did that energy go? All you were, you were laying in bed, tossing and turning all night. You didn't use it. Where did it go? And the vast majority would say, I don't know. They wouldn't know. So the more I asked, saying, did you feel this loss of energy after the voices showed up? Virtually all of them would say yes. All right. So I did a, a little experiment. Like it was a one to ten type thing. You know, how much energy did you have before the voices showed up? How much energy did you have after the voices showed up? You know, it wasn't real heavy-duty science. And, you know, it would be like, uh, okay, I had uh, five or six, my energy level, before the voices showed up. Then afterward, it would be, you know, uh, 
one or one or two. The, the, it was clear that their their energy level was clearly dropped. You know, after the voices showed up. So we did an analysis of variance on that, and it turned out to be statistically significant. Something is happening there. Their energy is disappearing after the voices attack. Right? So I would ask them, I'd say, uh, uh, okay, if, the, if, <clears throat> if the, the voices have come thousands of times, and every time they came, your energy level dropped to nothing. Where do you think it went? The common answer was, I don't know. They weren't even thinking about it. Mm -hmm. And when I mentioned it, then they come to thinking about it. But I would say 85% of them still didn't know. So I I tell them, I said, okay, if you stuck your hand in a fire a thousand times and each time you got burned, Mm -hmm. what was burning you? They didn't have any trouble saying the fire. Then I'd go back and I'd say, okay, if the voices came a thousand times in the last few years, maybe more, 10,000 times, and every time the voices came, you were devoid of energy, where'd your energy go? Still, about 85% of them would say, I don't know. The others would think about it and go, the voices took it? I said, well, that makes sense, doesn't it? Where else would it go? You didn't use it. You know, and it turned out that that was, that was a piece of information that the voices absolutely didn't want them to have. Wow. Okay. They did not want them to know that they were parasites. Because if you had a leech on you, you wouldn't just sit there and go, oh, well, I got a leech on me, would you? You would want to get rid of that thing, right? Of course. Yeah, well, that's, course. that's, that's the same thing with the voices. Once the patients realized that they were parasites, that they were stealing their life energy, their attitude toward them changed. Okay? Now they became an enemy. Okay? And that's what's got to happen. So there's two things that have to happen for somebody to recover fully from schizophrenia. Is One, they have to understand that those voices are not them, even though they appear to be in their head. They do not come from them. They come from the outside. Now, what Swedenborg said is that none of your none of your thoughts come from you. They either come from they come from either heaven or they come from hell. All right. But your he says your brain is today we would say it's like a radio receiver. It's tuned to a certain frequency, and you pick up that frequency of thought. Okay. Now schizophrenics are tuned to a very low frequency. They're picking up low frequency transmissions. Interesting. Yeah. So this is what attracts. This is why certain people are more affected than others. Well, you know? because their 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 frequency is lowered. So if you look at the history of schizophrenics, very mm-hmm. few of them mm-hmm. have not suffered some kind of very nasty, ugly, traumatic, physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. Virtually all of them have mm-hmm. suffered that kind of abuse. So what that does is it lowers their frequency because, you know, they make certain decisions about who they are as a result of that abuse. It's like, well, I'm no good. I'm horrible. I'm a bad person because otherwise why would these people be abusing me like this? You know, mm-hmm. so, so during that abuse, when their attention is turned on them, they make a decision as to why that abuse is happening. And far too often, it is because I'm a bad person or I'm unworthy or I'm no good you know, or I'm stupid. And, and that, that decision sticks with them for the rest of their lives. So they are now operating at a less than optimal frequency, yeah, a lower but, frequency. Yeah, but Jerry, even the abuser, you know, uh, you know, because when you're describing these negative, you know, people, I think people just gloss over it and say, well, that's negative self-talk. You know, the TED Talks, they're always calling it this negative self-talk or self-sabotaging behavior. But now I'm thinking that even the abuser possibly must have had these negative thought forms to abuse somebody. Yes. You know, because, you know, you know, I always wondered about when I talk to people, it could be, you know, work colleagues or, you know, anybody, neighbors, anybody, and they tell you about, oh, I don't like this person. And I always asked why. And they that's, said, oh, that's, that's why, 
because now it's a thought, all right. But what well, it is is they harm your dog. Did they harm your cat? No, they've done nothing no. to me. It's a it's, it's a program. You know, that's not discerning. The person has done absolutely nothing to you, right? But you're causing them problems in your neighborhood, at your work, at your job, and now you're really explaining a lot of dysfunction in society. Yeah. So what happens is that's a uh, like a computer virus running in the background of their mind. Mm -hmm. Okay. And it, it's a decision that they made. Now, if anybody shows up in their psychic sphere who looks or acts or reminds them of that abuser, whoever did that thing to them, then there's going to be the reaction that you just mentioned. I don't like that person. I don't know why. He irritates me. Um, I don't want anything to do with him. So there's a flight or flight reaction that fires off. Okay. It's it's either they, they take that person on or they avoid them or, or they, um, they run from them, okay? And that's, there's a new energetic therapy. I'll talk to you more about that later. It's yes, called the please. MACE energy, energy Method, okay? Uh -huh. It will go in. I've never seen anything work like this. It okay. will go in and it will remove that programming within an hour and get rid of it. It's an energetic therapy. So thoughts are energy, um, feelings are energy, memory is energy. You know, what psychiatry and psychology are doing is only treating the results or the um, symptoms of that cause. You know, so they're, they're, psychiatry is only treating the symptoms of schizophrenia. It's not dealing with the cause at all. They don't even know what the cause is. They're just trying to get rid of the symptoms and sell drugs. They're making, uh, what is it, 4.7 billion, billion, I'm not talking million, billion dollars a year selling any psychotic drugs worldwide to cure absolutely nothing and, and do more physiological damage than most other drugs. You know, these drugs will neurologically, with long-term use, destroy your nervous system. They will shrink your brain. And that happened in the psychiatric hospitals when they started doing autopsies on these people who were long-term on these antipsychotic drugs. They saw that their brains were shrunk like walnuts. So the, the researchers who did that published it, said, we suspect this is due to the antipsychotic drugs. Of course, the psychiatric mafia and big pharma jump in there and go, no, no, it's not the psychiatric drugs. It's the schizophrenia doing that. The schizophrenia is doing it. And you know, the researchers said, well, okay, let's see. So they started feeding antipsychotic drugs to monkeys, rats, and, and mice, and they found the same thing was happening. Okay, So with long-term use, these drugs are destructive to the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system. They don't want you to know that. Matter of fact, I don't think most psychiatrists are aware of it because it's the big pharma's keeping it hidden. You don't see it on a warning label. You don't see that research anywhere. See, Big Pharma controls what these journals are putting out. They're, they're, they control what is being published in, in the universities you know, through their grants. You publish something we don't like, we're not going to give you grants for this, this, and this. You publish something that we like, and we'll give you a lot of money. They're very rich. You know, they bought off the U.S. Congress to get this, this nonsense passed that the only valid medical treatment is you know, based around uh, drugs. And you look at these, these, you know, they, they advertise them on television, you know, all these, all these side effects of drugs. Oh, it could kill you. It could maim you. It could cause you a heart attack, you know, and still they're selling them. It doesn't matter. So it's, it's almost like psychiatry, you know, this, that Hippocratic oath thing. It's like they take that and they just trashed it. Yeah. Yeah, but that is horrible that it's shrinking your brain. Yes, with long-term no, use, it does no. neurological damage. Now, the new drugs they have out now have fewer side effects, but they still are neurotoxins. You know, you look at you some of these side effects for these things. The, 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 I have a list of side effects here somewhere. They're horrendous. Please, Mary, list them because I'll tell you here in Scandinavia, like, you hardly ever know anybody who's not on some kind of uh, medication, you know, this kind of, um, I don't want to say mental health medication, something to balance their emotions or panic attacks or anxiety or hallucinate something. And they, some people, they're not on one or two, 
you know, there are some are on a couple and they tell, you know, you know, people even joke about it here and they say, oh, you know, you know, this, you know, this one is on a happy pill. I don't think people know the side effects are decapitating. And no, 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 they, they, they you don't. Know something that's going to shrink your brain and right. act as a neurotoxin. I don't think you would be joking about it. Well, there's really, there's some people that are so far gone that there is no other treatment for them. You know, they, especially, you know, the ones I saw in the prison, they have to be on those drugs the rest of their lives because they're so far gone. There's nothing, nothing that can be done for them. Now, for the vast majority of people who are hearing voices and are still somewhat functioning uh, or, or able to be reached, you know, that, and I have to admit that there's a number of those people that I would not have been able to reach had it not been for these drugs. So th those drugs are basically major tranquilizers that calm them down. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now, the, vo the voices don't want them calmed down. Keep in mind that these voices are parasites. They feed off of negative emotional energy. So that's why everything they tell the patient is negative. You're no good. You're stupid. You're rotten. We're going to kill you. Uh, there's somebody tracking you. There's somebody staring in your window. Uh, there's a monster under your bed. There's a monster. In All this horrible stuff is to generate the negative emotional energy that these things feed off of. So once they flare that up, then then that um, that energy is taken. Now, I have no idea how they take it. I did have a couple of patients tell me they could feel their energy leaving while the voices were abusing them, but I have no idea how they actually withdraw it from the people. But there's a one-to-one -one correspondence. So those of you who are working with schizophrenics or have a schizophrenic son or daughter, ask them yourself. You know, Ask them, do the voices only say negative stuff? 99% of the time, it will be negative. The, the, what do the voices do when you repeat the 23rd Psalm? Uh, that's the first one I saw. A patient came to me and said, when I repeated the 23rd Psalm, the voices reacted like worms thrown onto a hot frying pan. They did not like it. They got very upset. You know? So I started handing out the 23rd Psalm, and we got the same reaction from scores of them in, until th one of the bosses saw that I was doing that and ordered me to stop doing it. Okay. Why would he order you to stop doing it? Were you were you receiving like very good feedback? Was it being was uh, were the patients well, when when I first started there? off when I first started off I went, well these things are bad. You know, these are mm -hmm. th these things are bad. So whatever they don't like, I'm going to give them more of it. Okay. You know, because mm -hmm. if if you didn't like something, Makes sense. You know, and, and somebody started giving you more of it, you would want to get out. You, you would want to get away from them, right? Yeah, yeah. It's like right. when you're detoxing, you know, you, if right. you want to get parasites, you give them the bitters. You take yes. the bitters in, right? <laughs> yeah. Yes. So sense. when I first started off, it mm. was like, okay, what do these things don't like? And mm -hmm. I would tell a patient to give them more of it. Now, the problem with that is, is that the voices get more upset when they do that. Okay. OK, so they have to weather through that. So they have to want to fight back against these things. So what these voices are doing is pushing their personality out of the way and trying to take over to where they can generate more negative emotional energy by getting the patient to do crazy, stupid things that get them in trouble and then cause more angst. OK, so in most people, there's a pushback against the original personality. But once I've seen several that have been completely taken over, there's no help from them. You can't you can't reach them. You know, the only thing they could do is take medicines. But for the vast majority of people that are hearing voices, you know, if 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 they can't keep them under control, mm -hmm. then they can start taking these meds for a while to calm them down and then go find a mace practitioner who can help them and get rid of these things. OK. If if they can't stand, take a stand against them, then, then then they're gone. But these things are very tricky. The, there's virtual uh, uh, scores of patients that I've worked with in in the state prison when I was working in the psychology department there, or in the state hospital. They would ask these voices, "Who are you? What are you?" Because they were just as curious about what these things were as I was. Mm -hmm. The voices That's would come back and they would say, "We are you." We in plural. In plural. 
So you have plural we, aspects. We yourself. are you. They're telling you. That. So, so they want the patient to believe that those thoughts that they're putting into their mind is actually who they are. If they can get you to believe that those thoughts belong to you, mm. then you're in worse shape than if you go, they're not coming in from me. They're coming in from this evil enemy source, and I need to block them or do something about that. You know? See, once you see that you have an enemy, then you have something to fight against. Yeah, but once if you, you identify the enemy, you know what it is, then now you have, you're have you closer to the solution. Yes. Right. You have something to, you can fight back against. But yes. if you believe it's you, who are you going to fight back mm -hmm. against? Yourself. That's why there's like 50,000 um, suicides in the U.S. every year. 50,000 people here kill in themselves. Scandinavia, Jerry, it's also increasing here. It's also increasing here in Scandinavia, the suicide rate. Yeah, it's horrendous. And each one of those patients, before they kill themselves, and most of, a lot of them are on, on antipsychotic drugs or antidepressant drugs, all right? So they have a thought put into their head to just kill yourself. You know, you can't, uh, you, 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 there's nothing else for you to do. It, it, you know, it's, it, you're helpless. You know, you know, just get it over with. And that's what the voices tell them, just get it over with. You just do it. Get it over with. Yeah. So 50,000 people in the U.S. every year are doing that. Now, you, you look at 50,000. That's as many people who died in Vietnam. That's how many soldiers died in Vietnam from here. Okay. 132 people kill themselves every day in the U.S. So you look at what's going on with the current psychiatric mafia and big pharma and 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 the and uh the psychiatric mafia there's more psychiatrists psychologists um and and psychiatric drugs on the planet right now than there has ever been in the history of mankind and yet mental illness is rampant you got 50,000 people killing themselves in the US every year we're getting worse as a country here. But I think it's the same thing here in Europe because the list, you know, there are always new names. You know, now we are getting, we've been introduced to PTSD, panic attacks, and there are other, there's so many different names you can hardly keep up. And these are now things you have to educate yourself with if you're working as a teacher, an instructor, an educator, because the student, the children are coming in with these um, you know, uh, diagnoses. So you have to yeah, know how yeah. to, well, see, that, to them and handle it. That's yeah. another thing with these diagnoses. People mm -hmm. react to those diagnoses as if they're a medical diagnosis. They are mm -hmm. not. You know, every wow. single one of those diagnoses has been made up. It's completely made up. Okay. So what they have is a panel of, of, uh, I don't know, 13 psychiatrists that meet every th th every few years, they make these diagnoses up. There is not a single test. There's not a single objective test for any of them. None of them. None? None. Just, these things... Are, I don't even know all the names, but there are many. There are maybe 10, 15, or 20. There are many. There are many. It's there, long the, well, th there is a long list, okay? It's a work of fiction. They teach it in the universities as it's the Bible. You know, I remember when I was in the PhD program, you know, you, you had to memorize all these diagnoses and the, and the symptoms. All they are is symptoms. They're symptoms of human behavior mm -hmm. that are, are taken and pathologized. So every single one of the 296 that exist right now in the DSM-5 have been completely made up. You know, they're fabricated. In 1952, there was a, the DSM-1 had 106 psychiatric diagnoses. The DSM-5 has 290, well, in 1980, the, the DSM, what, four, I think it was, had 256 diagnoses. Now the DSM-5 has 297, almost 300. They're making these things up as they go along. 
there is no proof. There's no test for any of them. You know, two thirds of the psychiatrists who are working to make these things up are have strong ties to big pharma. And what I've heard is that meeting that they have is like a, a tobacco barn. You know, somebody comes in and goes, hey, I got uh, an idea for a new psychiatric diagnosis. And they, they read it off and these are the symptoms. And then they go, well, can you think we can make a medicine that would treat those symptoms? And if, if so, they'll add it to the diagnosis. So there are no blood tests. There's no lab tests. There's no x-rays. There's nothing to, to objectify any of these diagnoses. It's not a true condition. These things are made up. You know? I, I don't even know how we can begin to explain this to anybody because it's it's just like finality. You know, the way it's addressed here, people come in already set. Yeah. You know? And yeah, people also claim it by the way they speak. They say, you know, I am, uh, you know, I am, or, you know, <laughs> I suffer from, you know, they already claim that label of those diagnoses. They yeah, embrace that's, it. that's, you know, that's too it, bad. You know? But let me cap this off. This is a, a statement by a psychiatrist. And one of the top psychiatrists um, in the country has also verified this. This guy says every single one of these mental illnesses were fabricated by breaking up segments of human behavior and pathologizing them. There are no blood tests. There are no lab tests. There's no x-rays, EEGs to validate a single one of these diagnoses. They are just classes of behaviors that a group of psychiatrists have voted to be a mental disorder. This was by Dr. Julian Whitaker, MD. And Dr. Ronald Pies, the head of the Psychiatric Times, also verifies the same thing. These are made up. They don't, they, there's no test to verify any of them. They're all subjective diagnoses. They have, some of them, they have, they have a mathematics disorder. Say, so if you don't like math, you're disordered. They have sibling rivalry disorder. So if two kids are fighting, that's a disorder. <laughs> they have they have caffeine, uh, <laughs> caffeine toxic disorder. If you drink too much coffee, you're you're disordered. And, and what and, is too much? Because we all have a different resistance. It, it doesn't matter <laughs> to them. Coffee's culture. If you it doesn't to matter to them. Culture. They they have one called uh, what Paris syndrome. I think it was. Uh, Japanese who visit Paris and uh, uh, we, we would call this cultural shock back in my day, you know, but now it's a Paris syndrome disorder. Okay? And, and they, they recommend it be treated with antidepressant medications. That's how big a scam this stuff is. And they've got the entire planet tuned into listening to this horse crap. Because well, what they're saying, what they're saying is people abroad, everybody will experience some degree of culture shock. You know, you're adjusting. It's a different weather. Everything's different. The weather, the food, the climate, the your whole life is different. So you need some adjustment time. Is this <laughs> culture? Shock? Yeah. So the, every, everything, everything, uh, uh, everything is aimed towards selling drugs. I mean, the whole system is aimed toward big pharma selling drugs. Now. These antidepressants, they, these SSRIs, this is just a short list of the side effects of antidepressant drugs that cure nothing, okay? Nausea, weight gain, trouble sleeping, dry mouth, blurred vision, dizziness, anxiety, headache, diarrhea, constipation, sexual problems, fatigue, tremors, increased swelling, lower alcohol tolerance, bleeding, lower sodium levels, vomiting, restlessness, muscle cramps, seizures, okay? And, and it, it goes on and on. The antipsychotic drugs are even worse than that. Okay. So, <clears throat> you were asking me what these things say. They say, Sherry, Sherry Sweeney, the, the, um, the co-author of our book. Oh, yeah, we had her on. Yes. yes. Yeah, we wrote. You know, she says... Now, you can get this over Amazon. It, it talks about how we came to the conclusion that mm. these things are entities. Okay, It's called yeah. an amazing journey into the psychotic mind. Sherry Sweeney says every negative thought that comes into your mind is put there by them. Okay, And that seems to match what Swedenborg is saying, since he's saying that 
none of your thoughts are your own. They either come in from heaven or they come in from hell. Right? So, you know, one of the big things that we teach all schizophrenics is that 98% of what these voices are telling them are lies. Yeah, they don't sure they told us about that. That's a right. lie program. That's yeah. a lie program. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew that even before I met Sherry, but Sherry mm -hmm. actually cured herself using that program itself, just that one alone, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. knowing that you can't believe anything these voices say. They're, they're consummate liars. You know, I had uh, one patient where they told them, okay, if you gouge out your eye, uh, we, we will go away. We'll never come back. So he did that. As soon as he did that, the voices came back and started mocking him, saying, look how stupid you are. You listen to us. Now you're maimed for the rest of your life. You look like a freak, you know, and started mocking him and laughing at him. So that's what we're dealing with. That's the kind of, that's the kind of force that we're dealing with. So you asked a while ago, how did, how did I come to the conclusion that these things were entities and, and not hallucinations? Yeah. So what I had was, was I was collecting these patterns, okay? And it was yeah. pattern after pattern after pattern after pattern. So they would energetically drain the victims. Uh, they got louder after sunset. They got louder when ignored. They would foster uh, self-destructive behavior. They'd foster isolation. They'd demand the attention of the victim. Uh, they'd maneuver for increased control. They would gaslight. They'd manipulate perception. Um, they have access to the patient's memory. They demand that the victim not tell anybody else about them. So we have 23 of these patterns right now. You can find them on my website at jerrymarzinski.com. Okay. So... <clears throat> With each one of these patterns that I saw, it was like, okay, these can't be hallucinations. So I'd start going, at, while I was working at the, in the state hospital, I could not experiment a lot to see what I could do to interfere with these things. Because if the psychiatrist found out that I believe these things were something other than hallucinations and that I was trying stuff to see how they would react, I would be in trouble. You know, matter of fact, the psychiatrists were being assaulted by paranoid schizophrenics at a rate equal to that of attendants on the psych wards who were with them 24 hours a day. So they were being assaulted at a horrendous rate by paranoid schizophrenics. And I remember seeing that and going, what are they saying to these people that are, uh, are ticking them off in the 15 or 20 minutes they see them a month? You know, what could they possibly be saying to these people that are getting them assaulted? You know, it took me seven years to figure that out. And it was toward the end of the seventh year when I was there, there was one gal who was doing good in her cosmetology program. I mean, she was about to graduate with a license so she could work. Mm -hmm. But the rule we had, if they went off their meds three times, we would discharge them from the program because at that time they would know no other thing to do beside give them the meds. And if they wouldn't take the meds, they weren't going to stay sane. So she went off a third time. I notified her mother, well, we're going to discharge her from the program. The mother went, you know, no, no, don't do that. I can't deal with her. Uh, I'll come up there and we'll talk to her. We'll find out why she went off her meds. And I said, well, okay, you know, come on up. She came up one Friday afternoon and uh, the mother and I were in, in the room and we're both of us are like, why did she do this? She was just on the verge of graduating. You know, so that's another thing they do. They sabotage any kind of success you're about to have. They will, they will get you to do something to sabotage it. That's consistent. Okay. So I was asking, uh, we, we asked this gal, you know, what, why did you do that? You were about to graduate. You had, you were about to take your final. You would have had a, a license. To, uh, you would have been a licensed cosmetologist. Why did you do this? She goes, you won't believe me. I said, you know, I've heard a lot of crazy things while I'm here. Just let it fly. Okay? She said, the voices told me that the psychiatrist was poisoning me with these drugs. Now, I just read you some of the after side effects of those drugs. Okay? Yeah, those drugs are, they, they are toxic. Yeah, they are toxic. All right. So all these yeah. side effects, they are actually being poisoned by these drugs. And these side effects are the toxic side effects of those drugs. Now they do calm them down. Okay. They, they do quiet the voices. 
So they do uh, handle the symptoms somewhat. They do do anything about the cause. All right. So um, that once she told me that, I went. So that's why the psychiatrists were being assaulted at that rate. The voices are probably telling those patients that they're being poisoned also. Now I've heard that several times from other schizophrenics saying, you know, these these medicines are poison. They're they're toxic, and and they are. Yeah. So well, that's so interesting that these entities know that the biological body is being poisoned, but their entities are they merging with the biology of the body? How how do they know? Okay. Their thought form. Can you describe what you have learned about the nature of these entities? Because well, I find it very interesting that they they can feel the effects of the biology. You know. Well, they feel the, the effects of the drugs. What the, they don't like those drugs because it calms the patient down. Remember, they're parasites. They want that patient as upset as they can get them because they're feeding off of that negative emotional energy that that person is generating. They can't generate that themselves. They have to yeah. have it generated how, by us. Yeah. And how did they know it was a toxin? How did the entities know this? They, they didn't know it was a toxin and they didn't care. What they care about is the patient being upset. They don't want those drugs calming the patient down. So that's the lie. Yes, that's, they were creating all kinds of stories to make the patient fall off their path or, yeah. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that they don't want the patient taking the drugs because those drugs calm the patient down. They mm -hmm. don't want the patient calmed down. They want them upset. They want them paranoid. They want them generating that negative emotional energy. You know, mm -hmm. If they feel bad because of the after effects of the drugs, that's even better. They want them feeling bad. They could care less about the patient they're infesting. They hate the human race. You know, they especially hate kids. Oh, they wow. they totally hate kids, which is scary considering all this child molestation stuff and, and these child trafficking rings that are going on right now. Those are all demonic enterprises. Yeah. Yeah. And right now, the United States is one of the biggest purveyors of human trafficking on the planet. They're not tracking any of these any of these children. That are coming in. There's thousands of children who have come over the border. They have no idea where any of them went. Same thing with the women. Yeah, I'm glad that you've touched on that because people don't understand really what's going on. People like to talk about migration. Oh, these migrants are coming. But when you see children, first of all, when people come to travel, you know, cross borders without identification, anything, and those are that's a haven for human trafficking because that's what traffickers need it's like a you know they're having a it's like a buffet oh it is they're, they're documentation the, the children can go missing nobody's looking right because nothing is documented you know so it's right. not just about migration you have to really understand there's so much stuff going on with uh you know what you call and it's good that you touched on that because people need to really look at the bigger picture Oh, they're no not. Matter, matter. Nothing is human trafficking. Yeah, Brazil has emptied out a lot of their prisoners up here. It's just sent them up here. You know, you you got you got terrorists coming across the border. They are destroying the United States right now, and the Democrats are keeping it going. You know, they, they're any 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 bill to try to shut down the borders is killed by the Democrats. They're all paid off. They're all demonic. Yeah, but yeah, but you know, migration is something else. I just know, as somebody who has, you know, worked with survivors of human trafficking, I know that some of the things that some of the ways they 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 get people to traffic is vulnerability, economics, finances, and documentation. Nobody cares. Nobody loves you. Then nobody's looking for you. I'm just summarizing over generalizing right. this. Right. Plus, we got the Chinese down there paying for their transportation up here, paying paying for their water, their food, and and giving them directions on how to get here and what to say when they get get to the border. The Chinese are funding all that. Yeah. 
Yeah, but but children need to. I mean, you need to really, you know, it, it, when you mentioned that these entities that they don't like children, that's that's you know, yeah, that's that, you know, again, these entities are. I think they're very disruptive. They're destructive. In, in oh yeah, ways. yeah, they're very destructive. Yeah, and and you know, you mentioned how they influence people to sabotage. Uh, themselves uh, their lives and i'm just thinking you know i think you're, you're touching on many things that i think people know about but they're not connecting the dots that these could be entities because you know everyone tells you that's self-sabotaging behavior but nobody asks why you did it yeah you know, and, and you ask the person would you do something like that to yourself on purpose and they go no yeah you know? And that's also with couples. You know, you hear people talk, you know, people, oh. to, I can't tell you how many times people have told me, you know, me and my husband did this. And I'm like, what did you fight about? She's like, I don't even know. I don't remember. See, and, and that's another thing they hate. They do mm -hmm. not like people being couples. They do not like families. So they do everything they can to disrupt couples. They'll tell them, the man to, you know, if, if, if one of them is hearing voices, you can bet your booties that the, the, the voices are telling that that person that their partner is cheating on them that they're doing this they're doing that they're doing all kinds of stuff they want to break up relationships they want to break up families yeah because people have heated conversation you know arguments over conflicts you know yeah and and this causes crazy outcomes you know it, it leads to so many crazy stuff and i'm like was it really conflicts you know and they're like yeah but you know and and, and you, you now is i'm connect you know you're connecting the dots you know they started they picked a trigger then they added you know on top you know and on, so they lowered your frequency then now they have a, a doorway you know yes. to come in yeah. and then you know let it fester you know yep that that's exactly what they want and the doorway is you know when you have a negative thought realize that it's not yours you know, you have to monitor your thoughts coming in because they're constantly transmitting. Now, now earlier you asked me, um, how did how did I come to the conclusion that these things were entities? Okay, so <clears throat> I suspected they were because of the patterns that they were running. So, mm -hmm. if they're running patterns, there's something that is keeping them on those patterns. They're not random. Mm -hmm. And it's and here's pattern after pattern after pattern after pattern showing up with hundreds of schizophrenics that I talk to. So this is this information is based on many hundreds of interviews with people who are hearing voices, paranoid mm -hmm. schizophrenics, and they're all saying the same thing. Okay. So what I started doing after these patterns started appearing, I'm like thinking, Okay, what would happen if I started throwing monkey wrenches in that pattern? You know, what would happen if I started interfering with that pattern? You know, <clears throat> and um, you know, I would tell them to do virtually the opposite of what the voices were telling them to do. And I couldn't do this in the state hospital because I, they'd already, you know, they were too touchy. They. Here's the psychiatrist getting beat up by these these uh, these patients. So they were already gun shy. They're going. The unwritten rule in the state hospital was you don't do anything to upset these guys that you don't have to. You know, if you absolutely have to, then then do it. But otherwise, you keep them calm. Don't do anything to upset them. Don't say anything to them to upset them. Just don't upset them, because the psychiatrists were getting beat up. Right? When I took the job at the state prison. Mm -hmm. Okay, the state prison was set up for violence. It was set up for disruptions. You know, if if uh, one of these patients that went to the psychiatrist at the psychiatric rehab center went to the warden at the state prison and said, "Hey, the psych is uh, asking me questions about my voices that I don't like," you know, the warden would go, "You get out of my face, man! Go play in the traffic. I got I got better things to deal with than than you know you being upset about being asked some questions." You know, it just, it wouldn't even come anywhere near breaking the, you know, the level of conflict and disruption that is usually going on in those places. It just wouldn't even trigger a warning sign. You know, so what I did is I collected around me a, a group of prisoners who were hearing voices who agreed in real time. 
to tell me what the voices were saying while we were in session in real time. And th the deal I made with them was, okay, if you do this for me, I'll do everything I can to help you out. We'll see if we can't figure out what these voices are. And if you run into trouble, just throw, throw a pebble at my window and I'll get you in as soon as I can. All right. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> I had an agreement with these guys and it worked. So while we were in session, the voices would be saying stuff like, oh, don't listen to him. He's crazy. He's stupid. He's a nutcase. You know, don't do what he said. Don't show up for your sessions. Don't get up. Don't keep your appointments. You know, they were doing everything they could to drive these people away from me. All right. So at times it got a little bit hairy because the voices would, you know, there was one time where one of the pay, one of these guys came in and one of the guards insulted him in front of some other prisoners. And he said, the voices are telling me to stab this guy. Oh, no. You know, so if he did that and the prison administration found out that I knew about it and didn't turn him in, I'd be fired. Okay. You know, um, so on the other hand, I had to, I had to, if I, if I did turn him in for saying that, then all of these guys would no longer trust me anymore. Mm -hmm. Every single one of them would back away and go, we can't trust him. As soon as we say something, he'll turn us into the guards and we're done. Yeah, so, exactly. so the investigation would be completely shot. I wouldn't, and not another prisoner on that yard would ever trust me because they don't, they already don't trust psych because what's the psych psychs do is they just, they monitor for psychotic behavior that's getting out of control. And then they turn them into the psychiatrist who drugs them. Right. So already there's not a lot of trust. So I had to earn that trust. You know, but sometimes it got a little hairy. I think in the long run, it prevented more problems than it caused. You know, not one of those patients actually acted out against a guard. Because I, I would increase the number of times I saw them until they were calmed down. Okay. But, you know, these patterns kept going on and on and on. And <clears throat> I'd give them stuff like the 23 Psalm, 23rd Psalm, say, okay, Use that every time the voices come. Come back next week and tell me what happened. Right? They would all report. They hated it. The voices hated it. They didn't like me saying it. You know, so I'd give them thing after thing after thing that uh, uh, would go against what the voices were saying. Yeah, what they hate, the entity. What they hate. So, so what, what happened is after a while, these guys started coming back to me in these sessions and saying, the voices are getting pissed with you. They don't want us coming here. They don't want us listening to you. They were giving me a, a crock of crap telling me this morning not to get up and go. They saying, call off your sessions. And this was happening with the whole bunch of them, you know, the, the whole 13 of them. All of a sudden, the voices don't like whatever I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, here, here's these reports coming and coming and coming. And I'm like, well, that, you know, that's tough crap. And then one of the guys that I was working with intensely and was doing good, he turns around in my doorway after one of our sessions and he looks me in the eye and he goes, you realize what you're doing is dangerous, don't you? And I, I never dawned on me. You know, I'm thinking, well, these voices are in your head. They're not in my head. They're not going to make me do anything. You know, I always suspected that they might make them do something, but you know, I was, I've been working extensively with these guys, some of them for like six months. So I trusted them and they trusted me, which is an odd situation for the prison. Uh, so I just looked at this guy and I, I didn't say anything because I didn't know what to say. And he just turned around and he walked away. And I remembered that, but I didn't quite know what to do with it. You know, it was like a warning. It was like a warning shot across the bow. Right. So I kept working with him and and a bunch of others. And then what was saying the next thing? Yeah, th here's the warnings. The next thing, um, next thing, this guy comes back some weeks later. I don't know how he got into the medical unit, knocks on my door, and he goes, um, the voices want to talk to you. And that never happened before. It was always the patient would always tell me what the voices were saying. Mm -hmm. You know, they'd, they'd be saying stuff like, he's crazy, he's stupid, don't listen to him. Uh, uh, what he's telling you is a bunch of crap, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. you know? And 
then I'd tell them to, you know, go tell the voices to go stick their head in the toilet or something like that. You know, so it, it would it'd be, be that kind of We're stuff. Having this bite. <laughs> It'd be this back and forth kind of stuff, and then and and then they'd tell me uh, uh, the the client would say, well, the voices are now telling me that, and I'd say, well, that's a lie. You can't you see it's a lie, you know, yeah. stuff like that. So he comes, he knocks on my door. He goes, the voices want to talk to you, and I'm kind of like surprised because that had never in 20 years previous that had never happened before. It was always the patient was uh, interpreting what the voices were saying and, and telling me what they were saying, you know. It was never talking to me directly. So he, he, he knocks on the door. I open it up. And he goes, the voices want to talk to you. I said, they want to talk to me personally? He said, yeah, they want to talk to you personally. And I'm like, okay. You know, Come on in. Close the door. said, have a seat. Sat back and I said, well, what do they have to say? And these words came out of his mouth. You have no right to interfere with our way of life my head went boom just exploded it was like our way of life you know and i'm like now nah, you you're joking around with me aren't you he goes no no i'm not joking around that's what they said and i said well tell them this and he said i don't have to tell them anything they can see you they can hear you <laughs> yeah. and that that weirded no. me out too you know it's like you know, so, so my head is just boom. And it was at that moment that I realized that these things were separate entities, that they were not, there was, they were not um, hallucinations. Here they were speaking. I was carrying on a conversation with them personally. And the, and I, the prisoners, he would say, that's not me. I didn't say that. You know, that's, that's them. They were, they were speaking. They were talking. I had nothing to do with what they were saying. Wow. So that, that warped my head. And I, I, I went into shock because I was denying this for years. You know? And now it breaks through. And it's going, we don't like what you're doing. We want you to stop. You, know? you have no right to do what you're doing. And I said something about, well, you're destroying these people. Yeah. You know, and then he, he kind of gets up and leaves and I'm in shock. I, I just shut down the office and I didn't uh, I didn't see anybody for the rest of the day. And there's nobody I could talk to about this. Except the prisoners. They knew, you know, I could talk to the people who were hearing voices. They would understand this stuff. But I couldn't talk to any of my colleagues. I couldn't talk to my wife. She was all, you know, when I tell her what I was doing, she'd go, no, nah, no, nah, you shouldn't be picking through the heads of psychotic people and in, in, in the prison who are criminally insane yeah and what are you doing you know because so it was even even her saying you know don't do this don't do this thing so i had nobody to talk to sherry was the first sane person that i was able to talk to about this stuff you know she understood so she was like a lifesaver because i couldn't talk to my boss i couldn't talk to other psychologists i couldn't talk to anybody about this so she was like a lifesaver you know, I could talk to her about this stuff and then I could ask her questions. Of, what did you experience? Did you experience the same kind of stuff? So after after some, some and so it was 10 years, I knew her before she ever admitted that she had heard his voices as a young, a young woman. So that's how much of a stigma this stuff carries. Yeah. So after talking with her for a good while, we went, we have to write a book. We have to tell people what's really going on. You know, they have to know. So, so we we wrote that book, uh, an amazing journey into the psychotic mind, breaking the spell of the ivory tower. You know, and it tells you how we came to this these conclusions. Yeah. So it didn't end there. So I was in shock for a good while after that, but I didn't stop working with this group of prisoners. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I read a book called The Voice of Knowledge by Miguel Ruiz. And I was always asking these prisoners questions. Oh, Miguel Ruiz has beautiful yeah. books. Yeah, he's, he's yeah. a good writer. Mm. Right. He's good stuff. Yes. So uh, I was always asking these guys questions. And I read a section of his book where he was talking about these voices as being parasites. There was a whole paragraph on it. Mm -hmm. So there was one guy I was working with that um, uh, he, was, he was doing okay. 
And I, I said, uh, I brought him in one day and, and we're sitting there and I said, uh, I got a paragraph from this, this shaman who was talking about what appeared to me to be the voices. I want to read you this paragraph and tell me what you think about it. Mm -hmm. you know? And so I started reading the paragraph and it, it got to the point where the paragraph was talking about these entities being parasites. Okay. At that very moment, I looked uh, <clears throat> I looked up and he had this glazed look on his face. He looked like a zombie. He was just staring at me. And I'm like, uh-oh, this doesn't look good. And uh, then all of a sudden I heard this behind me, this electrical crackling erupt behind my, behind my head. It sounded just like an arc welder. You know, it was like crack, 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 crackling this crackling sound. And I'm like, well, what the frick is that? You know, so I look at him and I said, did you hear that? And he just keeps staring at me like he's in a zombie in some kind of daze. He doesn't answer. So this crackling kind of starts working up the right hand wall of my office at a 45 degree angle. So it's like crack, 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 crack. And I'm looking and I don't see anything. I don't smell anything. I can just hear it. And it's moving. And it's moving toward the top corner, the right-hand corner of my office. And I'm, I'm afraid to take my eyes off of him because he looks so weird. So I push my chair against the wall in case he attacks. And I'm going, he's going to attack. You better keep your eye on him. So I push my chair against the wall. So if he does, he can't knock me over. So I can at least kick him back. And then I'm trying to split my attention between keeping an eye on him and this loud electrical crackling. So it starts it hits the ceiling and it starts crackling, crackling along the top corner of my office right across and over his head. So I'm able to keep an eye on him and look at where the crackling sound is coming from also. Right? And I'm watching this thing, but I still don't see anything. And he's just sitting there like a zombie, just staring at me like he's frozen. And he can't hear the crackling. It's not a. It's he not he a didn't. Perfect. He didn't respond when I asked him if he could hear the crackling. He just sat there staring at me. He did not yeah. respond. I'm bothered. Okay. Yeah. And he's just staring like a zombie, stark still, sitting in the chair like he's frozen. And then the crackling starts coming down the left hand wall where my chair is, and it's crackling down the left hand wall, and then it jumps into this rubber made trash can right by my left leg. And it's crackling in the trash can. So I look, I'm watching him and then I lean over and I look in that trash can and there's nothing there. It's completely empty. The inmate porter had cleaned it the night before. There's not even a piece of paper in there. You know? And I look up at him and I'm like blown out of my mind. And then he slowly gets up and he goes, I gotta leave. And he walks out of the office, like shuffles slowly out of the office and then heads out the hall. And I'm like totally relieved. I'm like, yeah, get out of here. <laughs> go, 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 stay out, you know. And I'm, I'm totally shocked. I'm like, what the hell just happened? So I go out into the hall and I check the doctors and the nurses office out there. Nobody's in yet. There's no, there's nothing out there that could have caused this loud electrical crackling. Mm -hmm. So I walk out front. There's nothing out front of the medical unit that could have caused this. There's nothing plugged in, you know, and I'm, I'm just blown away. I mean, I couldn't function. I closed down my office. I didn't see anybody that day. I think I took the next day off. Um, I was just completely shocked. Now there was no doubt in my mind that these things were could affect physical reality. So before that, I was like, I had seen scratches where they they had torn apart some of the inmates' backs, that the inmate woke up with, with bloody scratch marks across his back. But I was in denial that they could affect physical reality. When I heard this crackling in my office, that was physical reality. There was no doubt in my mind now that they could they could affect physical reality. The question I had is, what else could they do? I didn't know. I didn't know where this was going. I had no cognitive map. There was no book written on the voices. 
this was uncharted territory. Yeah. I didn't know what was going to happen to me if I kept crossing that boundary. I didn't know how dangerous this was. I thought at times I was losing my own mind. You know, it's like hallucinating this crackle. And uh, it was like three or four months before I got the nerve to call that prisoner back into my office. I didn't want to see him. Okay. Finally, I put out a pass for him to come, and he showed up. He's at the door of the psych department. I let him in, and he looks good. I was expecting him to be a wreck, a total wreck. Because yeah. if the voices could do that to him and turn him into a zombie, what else could they do? And he looked good. He had a lot of energy, which surprised me. And I mentioned that to him. I said, you know, you look good. You look like you have a lot of energy. I said, I thought the voices would have just torn you to pieces by now. And he goes, no, no, I'm, I, I haven't gained a lot of ground, but I've stalled them out. They're not gaining any ground, but I'm, I'm not losing any either. So he says it's like a Mexican standoff with them. Yeah. And, <laughs> he figured out how to. So, yeah, so he's, he's kind of fighting them to a standstill. He's still hearing the voices. He's not believing a lot of what they say. They're not gaining any ground, but he's not. He's not getting any better either because he's still entertaining some of the stuff they're saying. So I asked him, I said, you, you remember the last time you were in the office here? He goes, yeah, yeah, I remember. I said, did you hear that loud crackling at the time you were in here? He goes, yeah, yeah, I heard it. And I said, well, what in the blazes was that? And he said, well, that was them. And I said, them who? The voices? He goes, yeah, that was, those were the voices. And I said, well, what in the heck were they doing? And he said, they were trying to scare you off. Wow. Right? And I'm like, you know, do, 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 do. This is like Twilight Zone stuff. You know, this is, this is, this is, I used to watch this Twilight Zone all the time and now I was in it. You know, here it was, do, 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 do. I could see Rod Serling just going right there, you know, he, I can see him right there. You know, do 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 do. This psychologist did this, and then it was, you know, and the and the do do do. You know, it's like I was there. You know, it's like this time you were there. You know, I'm there. So you know, and and you know, I, I I was in shock. I was just I went into a deep shock. I mean, my denial system completely collapsed. It was already tied together with bailing wires and rubber band. You know, I had overwhelming evidence that these things were not, you know, they were not hallucinations. But then when they come out of this guy, you know, and they're telling me, you have no right to interfere with our way of life. And then the inmate is swearing on the Bible that, you know, it wasn't him who said that, you know, and, and I trusted him. I mean, you know, I had a relationship with him you know? and it was like, Okay, what am I getting myself into? Where is this going to end up? I have no cognitive map. I don't know where this is going. I, I don't have, I, I, it, this is blind territory. This is, you know, what am I going to do? You know, it's either back off and, and cower down and, and stop the investigation mm -hmm. or just take my chances. You know? Now, thank God I was an adrenaline junkie. <laughs> <laughs> if I wasn't, I probably would have backed down. <laughs> <An adrenaline. laughs> so this was, a, it was, it had a, a, you know, a little bit of excitement. <laughs> well, yeah, there, it was, there was nothing boring about it. That's for sure. You yeah. know, now, this, you is, mm -hmm. this is what yeah. happens. This is what happens when the voices come close to taking somebody over. This was written by one of the patients I worked with. Oh, wow. Oh, no. It's so like they've lost total so, control so, of their body. Right, the loss of control of their body and mind, both. Yeah. And what I was going to ask you is, um, why do you think clinical psychiatry is not willing to take a leaf from, like, you know, religion, Christianity, the church? Because the Muslims know about this. They wouldn't yes. be shocked. The Muslims are much the better. Yeah, they're the much Christian better at the realizing what's going on than the Christians are. Even the Catholic Church, we've seen all the documentaries and movies where they do the exorcisms and stuff. Yeah, and so they're one of the they're one of the few churches who do that. 
yeah, why is the clinical psychology not open to having this tandem, you know, where, I mean, you want to help the patient, you know, if this is not working, maybe you want to have a tandem and take a leave from these other. Well, you, would, you, you would think so, but they don't. You know, they, the clinical psychologists and the psychologists would say, I'm crazy. This is a bunch of crap. What I say to them is go to my site and look up those those uh, patterns. If you're working with schizophrenics, you will see those patterns for yourself. You can ask them questions. They will tell you that these are the patterns these things run. If they're running patterns, they can't be hallucinations. They don't want they don't want to change their cognitive view of anything. Here, here they are spent their lives studying psychology. And, and when, you know, when I got to the front lines, I spent two years in a PhD program. I couldn't stand it any longer. It was brainwashing. It was like, oh, you're one of the elite now. And they're teaching you all this stuff that wouldn't make a worth, you know, a hills of difference on the front lines. You know, yeah. now when I ran into MACE, that made a huge difference on the front lines. Yeah, talk to us about the maze treatment because you know I guess if we are waiting for psychology to catch up, you know, well, it's a, it's a, going to suffer, right? Well, it's the same it's the same phenomena as when who was it? Uh, Galileo said the world was round, mm -hmm. you know, and they persecuted him for that. Yeah, you know, they don't want to change their thinking. You know, they they have yeah. all this power that all their money depends on this, their jobs depend on it. The, the psychiatric mafia, they're depending on everybody believing this crock of lies that Big Pharma and, and the psychiatric mafia have put out. Their jobs depend on it. Yeah, and academia yeah. is very rigid. Anyone who's been through Very it, rigid, it, and you don't question them. Very rigid, and they have an, such a huge ego. You know, yes. even in their own speech and what they say, they say these are theories. You know, when you write your paper, it's theoretical knowledge. It's, so, you you know, it's a theory. Anyone can debunk it, come up with a new theory, and, but they don't even accept. You know, it's such a strange um, system, but they have such a huge ego. And they give you, it has to be peer-reviewed by everyone who's... Oh, yeah, yeah. peer-reviewed by a bunch of people who don't know crap. You know, yeah. so so this, this is what I'm faced with at the present time. All I can say is go to the list of patterns that these voices run on my website mm -hmm. at jerrymarzinski.com under articles and see for yourself. This isn't hidden in genetics. There, there's no mystery to it. There's no biochemical imbalance thing that you can't see for yourself. You can see these patterns run for yourself and know that if these these uh, voices are running patterns. They're not hallucinations like the psychiatric mafia and big pharma insist they are. You know, hallucinations don't run patterns. Okay, so here's the evidence for yourself. You could go see it for yourself. You know, it's it's right there. Okay, so what what they're doing is is <clears throat> they don't realize that these entities are energetic entities. Energetic. Yeah, you're, you're, they are, they're energetic entities. They don't have a physical form. They, mm. they don't, there is no time. There is no space. There is no matter in the universe where they operate. Okay. So they can follow a schizophrenic to the depths of the ocean. He can move from here to, you know, Timbuktu and the voices are still there. There is no time or space or matter where they're at. So they can travel instantaneously. Hmm. You know, wherever they want to go, they can follow that person anywhere. Okay? Yeah. So, you know, MACE is an energetic therapy. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So it deals with energy. So memory is energy. Uh, feelings are energy. Thought is energy. Uh, your spirit is energy. So <clears throat> these, these entities are energy, but they are negative energy. Okay. And they're trying to create more negative energy out of the person. Okay. So the, the biggest source of psychological problems is trauma. You know, it's, it's either physical, sexual, or, or emotional trauma. Okay. 
And as I was explaining earlier, during that trauma, the person makes a decision about who they are, and it's not a good one. Mm-hmm. And that, that gets buried in their subconscious because the feeling is awful. You know, so you have this trauma, you have this horrible feeling, and you just can't get rid of it. So the ego shows up and it goes, let me handle this. And it takes it and it buries it in your subconscious mind and then locks it down. But it's buried alive. It's not dead. Okay? So then you have this um, that phenomenon we talked about where somebody shows up who reminds you of somebody who be- abused you. You know, they're not the same person, but they remind you of that. And then you automatically don't like them or you find yourself attacking them or avoiding them. Okay. Yeah. Or so, you could have experienced, you know, you could have experienced, you know, a war and you lost all your family, you know, that's yes. a huge trauma that is very hard to recover from, especially as a child. All, all of a sudden everyone's gone. You know, right. now we look at all the wars, you know, you can they must be having a frenzy in these places. Oh, right? they are. Yeah, and they're have they're they're having a hogs fest with this war in Ukraine. They are just that's like a hogs trough for them. They are just feeding relentlessly there. You but look at all the all the people Palestine. who are suffering and dying there. Yeah, there's Palestine, there's Congo, there's so many of them. You yes. know, right? There's so many. And we're talking about millions of people, not just a handful. And so they they, they foment they need to thrive, then you know, here we go, right? Yeah. <clears throat> and they foment these wars. You know, they foment them. You look at what the West is doing right now. All these Western countries, they're totally psychotic. If, if you look at this list of patterns that I have listed here, there's a one-to-one correspondence between what's coming over the mainstream media right now and, and what the Western leaders are saying and, and what these voices tell schizophrenics. You look at it. They're negative. All this negative news coming down, all these lies coming out about what Russia is doing. Yes. You know, you look at you look at Ukraine. They, Zelensky has banned religion there. He's 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 cut people out of the church. They foster and create negative emotion. Look at all the negative emotion that's being created by these wars. You know, it's it's but just the media. I think we underestimate the power of negative media because you can traumatize people through the perpetuation of fear, 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 fear. fear right. They're, they're solutions. You know, they're perpetuating so this might- fear. Yeah. Just just like they did with the uh, this, I don't you know I don't want to say that you know this this. Yeah, I know what you want to say. Yeah, no. Yeah, I mean they they fostered and perpetuated that, you know, and it was lie after lie after lie after lie after lie, and they're still telling these lies, you know. And right now they're blaming Russia, you know, for oh Russia invaded Ukraine. No, Ukraine was run by the Kazarian Mafia. It's one of the most corrupt countries on the planet. You know, it, it, <clears throat> they, the U.S. and the politicians here were laundering millions of dollars through Ukraine. They were but bombing. You the Jerry, the back and forth, there's always, there always has to be this back and forth. You know, you did this and you did this, but in between, there are casualties. You know, while people yes. are fighting about their ideologies and their politics and their money and power and control, there's there's there, there are real human lives who are casualties of right this. and and these these negative entities don't want you to even consider that oh that this is happening in ukraine that's thousands of miles away it doesn't affect you you know and you're right there's massive suffering over there because of this and even the russians are suffering horribly also yeah but you the know? suffering is everywhere jerry there's haiti just next door to you guys you know that's not very far oh yeah no it's you everywhere to ukraine to see this i mean there's so much you know even across the border in, in you know in, i mean it's everywhere you know it's yes. um, it's everywhere you know and, right and now, these, you know, yeah and it's these, not just these... one country you know also that they focus on one place that everyone should focus on this for the longest time there was a lot going on in yemen Nobody was talking about that, you know, so right. and it's constant, you know, now when you talk about these entities and the archons and the energetic uh, food that they need, you can see that the way things play out, they have a con, they ensure a constant supply. Yes. You know? And so if it's not been supplied from the Congo for centuries, I think it's been supplied from Yemen, it's been supplied now, there was Ukraine, there's Palestine, there is 
Haiti, there is where else we could go, uh, you know, El Salvador, you know, it's yeah. always somewhere. It, it goes on and on and on and the on. The Middle East also, you know, there's so many countries there. So, yeah, I think this is quite interesting. So, Jerry, I think yeah. uh, I want to thank you so much for coming. This has been a quite an eye-opening conversation. And um, I want to thank you really for coming and sharing um, this, um, what you have discovered in the field of psychiatry. I think you have shed a lot of light into what people may not know exists in psychiatry, that there is actually a dark side to it. You know, it's not just the, you know, the clinical studies and the pills on the top, but actually there is more that we should investigate further. Um, and I'd like you to have the last word and maybe share something that we might have missed and that you'd like to share with our listeners. Okay, I want to I want to cap off what you were saying. So, I found I found this on the internet. It said in the past two hundred years, over one hundred million people on Earth have lost their lives due to war. Over a time span of three thousand three hundred fifty-eight years, only twenty-three of those years were peaceful on the planet. Okay, so the other thing I'd, I'd like to say is, you know, if if you're struggling with a mental health problem, please try the Maze Therapy Method first. You can go to www.causisminstitute.com. That's C A U S I S M I N S T I T U T E dot com, and there will be a list of Maze therapists available. So. They will treat the cause of the problem and not just the symptoms. Okay. And <clears throat> psychiatry and psychology don't want this getting out. They're not supporting it because it, it is threatening to them to have a system that can treat the cause of psychological problems instead of just the symptoms. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jerry. And to all of our listeners, thank you for stopping by. I want to remind you all that you were listening to our smart guest, Jerry Mazinski. All his information will be in the description. So make sure you stop by, have a look and, you know, click on the links. There are a lot of very useful resources, including the MACE therapy, which we will add to the description and see what picks your interest and then just go for it and, you know, just share it because you know, I think mental health is just one of those things that people may not be comfortable talking about. So you can just share it and see, you know, let people decide for themselves what could be relevant for, the, for them and their loved ones. So thank you once more, Jerry. Thank you. And to all our listeners, thank you. Th thank you for having me. You're welcome.